All right, welcome to the talk on composable generators and property based testing. Uh, I have to apologize in advance because I barely uh, uh, came out of cough uh, and cold, so my voice may not be as strong. Uh, so if you have uh, difficulty hearing in the back, you might want to come closer. I won't cough on you. Um, <laughs> how many have you been to or seen, let's say, uh, the uh, Fun with Lambda's talk I did uh, at, the, at the code camp before, uh, or maybe online, or on my blog. Uh, has anybody uh, seen those? Okay, uh, one person. That's fine. Uh, some background in the C++ Lambda's will help. Uh, this talk is relatively uh, uh, intermediate to advanced talk. Uses some of the things. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time uh, explaining what Lambda's are. Uh, I sort of uh, assume that you know what they do. So uh, I'm Sumant Tambe. Uh, I work at uh, Real Time Innovations. I've been uh, just no, uh, got notified about the third year uh, of my Microsoft uh, Visual C++ MVP award. So that's great. Uh, thank you, Microsoft. If you are, if anybody Microsoft, from Microsoft is here. Um, okay, let's get started. So this talk could have been alternatively titled Functional Style API Design in Modern C++. Uh, you really don't think of these two things together, but uh, C++, new C++ has enough ammunition in it to do uh, really uh, powerful functional designs. And of course, uh, those get uh, translated into compiled code, which executes extremely fast. My experience in uh, functional programming uh, in C++ began uh, Back in 2008, over a period of time, I have I've been working on uh, RX for DDS and Reflex. And today's talk is going to be about not Reflex, but testing in Reflex, testing Reflex itself, and how functional programming becomes uh, useful uh, over there. Uh, I've been uh, blogging at C++ Tools. Uh, you may have stumbled upon the idioms book. And again, uh, the same projects I just uh, uh, gave you overview of. Uh, all of them are actually open source. So why would you care to be in this talk? Right. The slides are a little bit stuck. I don't know why. So if you want to write software which is uh, bug free and very expressive, and you want to be very productive about it, you, know, you don't want to spend hours and hours and hours writing code to, uh, to produce little or small design. I'm not saying that you can do that, but you know, uh, if the language isn't expressive or the techniques are not expressive enough, then uh, you spend a lot of time um, um, dealing with the with the language complexity, not necessarily your problem. And functional programming lets you uh, leapfrog that. So you can also get you know, uh, better modularity, reusability, extensibility through that, because all these things kind of help you achieve um, bug-free and expressive code. Performance could also be improved. We are not going to look at any techniques for necessarily for performance today, but in general, this style will help you achieve higher performance. <coughs> Still not responding to my keystrokes here. Okay, so uh, I have really packed agenda for next one and a half hour nearly. It's, uh, it's easily going to take 75 minutes, I think. So, uh, you know, hold on tight. So property-based testing, I'm going to cover what that is. Then why do you need composable generators for that? It facilitates property-based testing. Uh, then the design and implementation of libraries, generator library in C++. Then mathematics of that API, which is um, uh, probably going to be a little, a little dry, I don't know. Uh, category theory, if you have heard about those. Uh, things like functor, monoids, and monad, I'll touch upon those. And then uh, some template uh, meta programming. Compile, uh, generating types at compile time. So what's the property? Let's look at a few examples. Reversing a linked list twice should give you the same, same list. So uh, over here, it's not about the identity, it's about the contents of the list. It could be, there could be you know, two lists, separate lists, but they are indistinguishable because if you traverse both lists, they are the same. So for any list that you will create, you should be able to say, hey, yeah, like reversing this twice, should make no difference. Or a compression algorithm, if it, uh, uh, you know, uh, if comp there's a compression of some, some blob of data, its size should be at least uh, less than ideally 
or it could be actually equivalent to, to your input. And the last one is again, uh, this is what we are going to look at today. A serialization and deserialization of any object, any, any input string should produce the same object back because uh, that's, that, 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 that's what you really expect. So these are some properties, very generic, right? You don't really, mm, uh, they just should hold irrespective of uh, what you're trying to do. So reflex, the similar situation comes up in reflex. Now I'm going to show you uh, what reflex does. It's basically a serialization and deserialization library, if you think about it, in the simplest terms. Uh, it act also serializes types, by the way. Uh, it takes your C++ data structure and generates a type representation of it, and that, that you can send over network. And of course, you can serialize data itself. So this is particularly uh, used in uh, DTS, Data Distribution Service. I'm not going to talk about that uh, much today. So it takes the C++ struct or classes and constructs a representation that you can share with other processes actually. It's a C++ 11 library and available uh, for download. So a quick overview of what it does. So here is an example for this shape type. And it has got some state, color, x and y shape size, and some constructors to create an object of shape type, and some getters to get the value. So if I want to serialize this type, take its guts out and send those out to the out on the network, including its type and, and data, in reflex, you will write something like this. Uh, you describe what's in it, because C++ really does not have a reflection at uh, runtime or compile time, but it has kind of interesting compile time introspection capabilities, which are used here. So you sort of describe what's in your structure and how to get to it. You say, okay, to get to the string, to get to color, use that getter, and you describe what its type is. So it sort of mirrors what's already on this side. So this is a fairly mechanical job to create something like this. Once this is available, you can write uh, some code that will just send your data out uh, using some DDS uh, uh, communicating, uh, communication uh, API. So to test a library like this, I think property-based testing comes really, really handy. So here is an actual property in uh, reflex code, in reflex test code. What it's trying to do is, uh, hey, for any some type t in, I uh, construct a its equivalent representation for dynamic data. You don't have to be, you uh, don't need to know what the what those are. Essentially, it's a serialized representation of its type and data. And I put that in. Uh, wait, where did it go? Uh, in out. Yeah. So I put it in in this uh, save db, and I extract that out in out. So at the end of it, this is essentially serialization and deserialization. At the end of it, I expect in and out to be the same. If it does not hold for any property, something really bad happens. So that's it. All right. So it is property-based testing is complementary to traditional testing. It's not like an alternative. I mean, it is a you don't replace your existing testing with property-based testing. You add property-based testing because it helps you achieve certain other you know uh, qualities with it. Uh, so you specify pre and post conditions. In this case, there was a post condition that in and out must be exactly the same. It encourages programmers. I think this is really important. It helps you think hard about your software. It's like, what is it that I'm really trying to do? And this is a very abstract concept. Like, right? so serializing pieces should should hold just true for any case. It is very declarative. You don't really specify much, right? In the earlier test code, you just said, hey, this should hold for no matter what. And now you let a system, some code generation or uh, data generation facility, to prove you wrong. So you are up against a, a computer who's generating data for you and saying, hey, try to break my code if you can. And it will produce really, really bad input and output for you. I mean, input. And it will test your output for that, against that. And uh, you know your, your program should hold uh, up against that. Uh, that way, you can, the computer will generate the uh, uh, edge cases for you, uh, and that's much uh, easier uh, in that case. So you need data generators for that, because now we're going to switch our attention to how to build these generators and you know, uh, uh, drive test cases. And you get free reproducers. Some of the uh, really good uh, property-based testing frameworks out there in Haskell, Scala, they actually shrink 
the input to the smallest possible that breaks your code, which is awesome. So uh, if you get a, a test case that is like a, for a really large XML file, maybe it breaks, but then you have to find out where the real problem is. It will shrink the input automatically for you. You have to write some code for that generally, uh, and give you the smallest possible input polished pills. So this is pretty neat. So here is a property uh, test. I think I just covered that. Oh yeah, all I want to mention here is, in this property property test, what's the input data, right? All I'm saying is, for all t's, I don't know what t is, and I don't even know what n is. So both are missing, really. But it should really hold, right? I don't know what the input data is. It could be anything. If it's shape type, or if it's a string, strings of all lengths and whatnot. Uh, and what's the input type? Maybe it's not just string, it could be arbitrary type. So we are going to generate both of them today. So first part is of course generating data because that, that tends to be a little bit simpler. So random numbers are going to be your best friend. Uh, it's amazing how useful random numbers can be. So here is a simple example how you might create a, a function, rand, which produces a random number. Uh, if you are uh, C++ 14 or 11, uh, uh, you know, purists, you might use something like this. Proto, system clock, time since epoch to just produce a random number, I guess. But this particular random number generator is uh, well known uh, with its characteristics. So the standard library has those uh, built in for you. Uh, but we're just going to use that. We don't need very, very fancy random number generators anyway today. Uh, just a regular brand function will do just fine. So here is a very simple Boolean generator. So the, the scheme, uh, the, the style of this talk is going to be use smaller, simpler uh, generators, or uh, random number generators to build more complex, more powerful generators. So a, bo a Boolean generator would be simply mod 2. It will you know, just return true or false depending upon what it generates, what the random number generates. And an uppercase character generator would be uh, similar to, you know, you just generate a random number, mod 26, and you add A in it. And that's it. It will produce one number in that range, uh, or a character in that range, uh, because, uh, you know, it's just uh, the ASCII value. Uh, by the way, you can stop me if you like. Uh, um, if you have any questions, feel free. This is a range generator. Uh, it's a function that takes a low and high value and it produces a number in that range, uh, inclusive. So you would add low plus some basic math. All right, but then it's a little bit inconvenient, right? A uh, range, every time I have to sort of specify this range, low and high, to get a number. So it would be easier if I just save this low and high numbers uh, in, a, in some sort of state and just keep calling a function called generate or something like that. It will just give me that, that number uh, when, I, when I need it. So here is make range function, make range generator function. So what it returns is a lambda. And that lambda has uh, no parameters. It remembers your low and high. And each time you call this, for instance, each time you call range gen once, so you get a generator on the other side, R. And each time you want a new number, you just call R, like a function. So, because it remembers low and high, it's just like an object. You could, you could write a simple class that does this. Uh, it's just easier uh, with, with lambda. I rarely use this style uh, throughout code. Throughout so here is a one-off generator, let's say. So it takes a, a range of values, in this particular case, uh, weeks of, uh, days of, uh, in a week. And it produces a generator, and I call this function uh, gen, which will produce one of those days, that's it, uh, each time uh, you call it. So it remembers the state, in this case, in a vector. Uh, this is C++14 syntax, by the way. Uh, to construct, you take, you take a list, a static list, and you construct a vector from it, uh, let's say positive to a, to a lambda. And then each time this function is called, it will just pick one and return you the uh, one of those bits, or one of those bits. All right. 
So, so far, uh, you might have heard about this, uh, uh, this code, uh, that closures are poor man's objects, and objects are poor man's closures. Uh, I think it's uh, quite, quite uh, interesting that this actually turns out to be very true. Uh, I found it, uh, you know, uh, really sort of uh, makes sense. I mean, big people, you know, uh, who have, which uh, we uh, from which we learn stuff from, have said it, so I guess it must make sense, it does. So here is uh, a comparison of, you know, how, um, does it make sense to always have a closure as a generator, or um, maybe you need something more? And I think the answer depends on the language. So, closures is one way of creating object that has exactly one method, but then that becomes kind of um, uh, not so clean or useful in language like C++. Because we are used to calling a whole bunch of you know, uh, member methods. And in a lambda, you, you, do, you get just one method, which is, mm, becomes a little bit inconvenient. Not in other languages, uh, you know, they are uh, built around this function abstraction a little better. Uh, so uh, my answer here is no, uh, you need actually something better than lambda. But you are not going to give up lambda. So, so what I'm going to do is create a gem template. And uh, this is how I'm going to represent generators. So it has uh, uh, a gen func, that's what uh, we will pass in, that's the generator function. So each time you create a gen instance of gen, you pass in an implementation of generate function. So remember in the usual object oriented programming, you will pass in values to create an object. Here, we are going to pass in an implementation of a function to create an object. So, because this functional program, you know, functions are first class values, so you could just, why not, you can actually do that. So, gen has a constructor that takes any lambda uh, as, a, as an input, a gen fun, and it just uh, stores, it actually inherits from it a private view uh, to allow some sort of uh, um, empty base optimization. Uh, if it's possible, it would achieve that uh, over here. And then the generate function, simply forwards it to the operator that genfunk has. Remember genfunk is a lambda, it has exactly one function in it, which is that it just calls it and that's all. And whatever it returns, it returns. So you can create many gen objects uh, with, uh, by passing these uh, lambdas in, but what, what do you gain out of this, right? I'm going to add a whole bunch of uh, member functions in this case, map, zip, concat, concat map, reduce, where, scan, and take. So these are functions that can be applied to any generator. And that's why they are member functions. Note that they are all const. They don't change the generator that you are operating on. But in fact, they return a new generator. We'll look at some examples. The return path is always auto because uh, it will be deduced uh, automatically based on what parameters you pass in. And the parameters are not the values, but remember, those are in almost all the cases are going to be functions. So, uh, to map, say, almost all functions here. So, in some way, these are, not some way, these are the higher order functions because they take not values as input, but uh, functions as input. All right, so how would you uh, uh, implement or create a simple range generator, let's say? Uh, so there is a helper function here, make gen from, which is the very basic function that takes any gen, uh, any function that you have passed in, gen from, and returns an object of the gen template that we saw. So uh, to create that, uh, remember gen takes two arguments. The first one, is the return type of the function. So whatever the generator returns, if it returns an integer, then the decal type of func will return its t, essentially. It's, the, it's going to be int. Uh, that's, that's how C++ 14, I think 11 as well, uh, allows you to uh, extract, hey, what's the type of this thing? If I call this, what will be the type of the value I get back? It's not the value itself, it's the type of the value. So I pass that in. And so that's the uh, that's the type of the gen fun. And this is just regular perfect forwarding uh, of uh, arguments. So whatever function that you pass in, 
will be part of the, the change, uh, change in the map. Is it making sense so far? Uh, so the map range gen is an example of how to use map gen from. So it takes low and high as two, two uh, ranges, uh, two endpoints in the range. And I pass in the same function that we saw earlier to make gen from. So instead of just returning this itself, there's a little bit, little bit more ceremony here, and now you return a, a gen um, like that uh, from this. Because of that, you now get all these higher order functions that are defined on the generator. Uh, map, uh, uh, reduce, uh, I don't know, concat, all of them with you. So these higher order functions are going to be really important. Our, my, my focus is going to be these functions. And they are they form an algebra. What that means really is anytime you call those functions, you get another generator back, a new one. You don't modify the old, the one that you're calling this on, but you will always get a new generator back. So that means you but these functions let you do a lot of things with generators without really leaving that universe ever. You can always find some way of combining these functions one way or the other. And not just, there could be many more actually. Uh, this is, these may not be sufficient or you could write your own if you like. Uh, but these are common. In most uh, function style sort of libraries you will find uh, functions that are uh, named similarly. Because they form an algebra, you can create, you can always stay in that universe and produce interesting generators that will do the right thing for you. So let's take an example, what I mean by that. So here is how you would map over the generator. So mapping is a very common, uh, commonly done abstract, a commonly done operation on uh, generators on many uh, objects actually, uh, maybe less, or uh, those kind of things. So here is a vector of strings uh, called days, and a range generator. I'm creating a range generator here. It will produce values between 0 to 6 every time range gen is called. Or every time when you call range gen dot generate actually because now we are moved away from the function uh, the lambda but we have object of gen template. So you have to call dot generate which will essentially calls the function inside. So range gen, and we map over it. So for mapping, you, you have to pass in a function to it. This function will take each value that comes out of the source generator and will produce a, a different value. So this function that you have passed in, it's a lambda. It remembers days. And for each value that comes from the range, it will map it to some day. That's it, because we know that the, the values that are coming in are always going to be 0 to 6. We're not worried that this is, this is never going to be a, a overflow or, a, you know, a, beyond the boundaries. You know, the axis is always going to be between 0 to 6 for this vector. So we know this will always succeed. And that's really it. Map really does simple uh, transformation of uh, a generator that is that is an int generator over here to a string generator, actually. So that's the transformation. And you achieve that by passing in a function which takes, uh, in this case, some a to b, no int to strings. Or uh, you could pass in any function here which makes sense. The trick is that you always have to produce a value. For each i, you have to have some value defined. You cannot just omit and say, hey, for this particular i, I don't want to say you. I don't want to produce any value, no, that won't work. Because map is a, is a structure preserving transformation. It says, look, here is the source things, and then the, whatever output it produces has the same shape. That doesn't mean it has the same values. It, it in fact does not, but it has to have the same shape. So it's a structure preserving uh, transformation. That's what map does. And you can just keep calling them out, you know, as much as you want, and it will produce uh, uh, random plays. Uh, uh, this will never turn into uh, Does it make sense? So? Oh, 
Okay, uh, so yeah, that popped up. Mm, I think I touch upon those things. So you have to pass a you know, function. So if you like some C plus plus syntax, then uh, still function. Any function that takes an A and returns a string will be good candidate over here. Uh, so you are mapping a, a generator of integer to a generator of string. This is very important that uh, you, you have to think in terms of a transformation of the objects. Uh, of, of the generator object without really producing any value. So here, up to this point, there is no value produced at all. There is only transformation of the generators. Uh, over here, you start producing the values. And that takes us to, I don't have really a good way to introduce this, but it's a counter. You can map over it. That's it. This is, generally is a counter because, um, you know, you can map over it. So, what does that really mean? So let's see if uh, functor laws, uh, they are defined in category theory, whether they hold or not. So there is a composition law. It says, if you map twice with two functions, f and g, in this case, this is f, that's g. The f simply returns base, and g turns it to upper uppercase. They are defined for all cases. They preserve the structure, they don't omit some values, they don't have any side effects. So if you map twice, it is same as mapping over a composed function. So let's compose those two functions together. So this is a lambda, which takes an integer and returns an uppercase string in this case. Uh, it takes the base, turns it into uppercase, and returns it. So you can verify that these two capital or uh, uppercase A generators are in fact identical. Not the object identity, they are different objects, they live in different space, but they are identical because their values are the same. Uh, if you run them in parallel, you know, in a for loop, they will always produce the same value. And that's because, hey, it's a functor and it satisfies the composition. There is another law called identity law, pretty simple. If you write, pass in a function that just returns its, returns its argument, a very simple function like that, take out of a return identity function, then really you get the same, same object back. So uh, they generate the same values, but their identities are different. So both of these uh, properties are valid for functors. And, uh, and for the generators uh, we've been looking at so far. So how you might implement function like map? So remember map is a member function of all the generators and it takes a function as an argument. So we pass in as a, a universal reference, function ampersand ampersand, and we just return another generator, right? new generator every time because it does not change, it's a const function, it just should not change the existing generator that you have. So it just returns a new generator, so that's what we are calling make gen from. And how does it do that? It remembers the state of the existing this, uh, it remembers it in cell, makes a copy here, and the function that you have passed in. And Remember, this is an implementation of the generate function. So when the top level generator calls generate, it calls the inner generate to produce a value. And in the, in, that's what the inner generate, that's what inner generate is called, and applies this function as a transformation. So over here, in the other example from, say, a, a range two days, self dot generate will produce an integer, simple integer between zero to six. That integer will go in in this function, which will turn and return back some, some string of the days. And that's what it does. As simple as that. So uh, C14 capabilities that you uh, capture this very succinct. This is pretty neat, I think, uh, how, uh, how you can uh, create uh, objects by passing in lambdas. So we were able to create, you know, we never created a different class like a mapper generator. Or you know, I don't know, like concat generator. No, you don't need that. You just you just pass in a lambda, just configure the, the function, uh, you pass in a function and that's it. So 
this is very uh, functional and not not for home in that sense. Okay, so let's uh, concatenate the generators. This is this will come up often uh, because generators are in some ways you know, they are they are lazy less. They, they are you know backed by um, a potentially infinite sequence, which is not in the memory because that will be that will be very crazy and won't won't work in practice. So here is again a similar example, uh, days, which are uh, which is a vector of strings, and I'm going to create a new generator, make in order check. Uh, in order just produces those values in order. That's it. Uh, goes from Sunday to Saturday. So each time you call generate, it will produce that value. What if you call more than seven times? This particular implementation will throw an exception. Out of range. I can I don't know what to do. That that that's the way. I chose to indicate it's an end of the generation um, sequence. That doesn't have to be the only way. Uh, there could be many. Uh, you could have another function that has an X. Do you have more data from it? You call that function first. If it returns true, then you call generate. There is a protocol, but it's essentially equivalent. Over here, uh, the generate will just uh, throw your hand, uh, you know, throw its hands in. Exception. No more data. And months. Again, uh, in order chain will produce those in, in order. And now I concatenate two generators. Pretty simple. The expectation is, of course, you know, you produce all the days first and then all the months. A very simple example. Just shows what, how concatenation works. But concatenation is actually very important um, and it's kind of very central to generator semantics. And let me just throw this at you. It's a monarch. It's a monoid too. It's, it's a functor as well as it's a monoid. So why, why is that? Well, that's because the concatenation satisfies certain properties. Concatenation here uh, satisfies one law called identity law. So uh, M and ID are, let's say, generators. M is of any, any generator you can think of. Let's take an example we took earlier, which is the in order, say, all weeks, or all days in a week. And ID is something there has to be a generator that, that, that is ID, which will, if you append to ID, it will produce the same, same object, you know, or the same uh, generator back. There is actually such a generator, which always produces, say, it's empty. It never produces any value. Never. It always throws an exception. Hey, I'm done. But it's very useful. Well, it's at, at least it's very important. It may, it may not be very useful. Um, in some cases it is, but it's very, um, important to prove the property that hey, the generators we are looking at so far are actually uh, a monoid because if you append the identity one, which is the empty generator, to any generator that you have, it will give you the same generator back. And that's just mathematical way of saying uh, that a monoid satisfies the, satisfies the identity law. And then there's one more law which is the associative law, which says the, the order of operation, the order in which you apply does not matter. So over there, we have uh, F, G, and H. They are generators. And uh, the little O there is a pen operation. Does it satisfy? Does generator satisfy this? Mm, I think it does. It's just like string concatenation. It really doesn't matter, you know, if you apply, say, if you have F, G, and H, three strings, it doesn't matter whether you concatenate FG first and then concatenate H or you do it the other way now. The result is of course the same. You cannot flip the order of the operands. That would be a disaster. But you can choose to do the same operation over here first and then over here. That will work. And it is satisfied by the generators. So we have in order generator here. It will produce 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 uh, in that order. And it doesn't matter how you how you sort of group them together. So I can append these two together. So my goal here is trying to show you that these uh, these laws look very cryptic and you know very dry to understand. But I have found it very useful to sort of see C plus plus code, which I know what it does, and then map it back to what that law probably means. I mean, this is a weird way of learning, but I think it helped me uh, because I mean, not necessarily in C plus plus because. Uh, I looked at some other language implementation like Scala and, uh, and Haskell to understand this. 
And then now uh, I, I'm, I'm more fam I'm hoping that you're more familiar with this, maybe. Uh, and then this is trivial, so extreme concatenation. Who even thinks about string concatenation? Like, of course, it's like the same thing. But then hey, you are really using the associative law of monoid, and uh, uh, that, that's that's what I'm trying to show. So um, maybe the right way of showing this is show this first and then explain. Hey, that just happens to be an associative. Uh, so here is how you might implement the empty generator. Mm, again, like C++14 uh, fun, then you always throw that exception. Every time, this is essentially implementation of generate, remember that. Pass in that generate function to be the generator, and always throw the exception, and that's all it does. The, the fun part is, this lambda needs to have, if you omit this last sentence, I mean, it, it is never going to, Execute this return statement, right? But if you omit this sentence, everything breaks. That's because the compiler needs to know, hey, what is the real life of this generator? It doesn't have any knowledge because it just throws. But it, you still need to sort of say that I will return the D without really ever doing it. So the compiler is happy to look at this, say, okay, this. This does something and returns a Okay, I'm happy. But then it really never does. <coughs> Alright, so zip operation. So this is actually quite useful. Now we'll see that you know, we can create complex uh, generators for complex types uh, using zip uh, for structures. So X generator and a Y generator, they are I'm using a different function this time, a stepper. A stepper is, think of it like a for loop, uh, goes from range 0 to 100, 1 at a time, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 100. And uh, depending on what parameters you pass in, it may cycle back, start at 0, or it might throw an exception saying, hey, I'm done with this range. So the second one, the Y generator, produces values, only even values, 0 to 4. That's what that's the state function, and both of them are actually finite. So I know that they will end once once it hits the uh, it, it hits the limit. So I want to produce a, a two D point from a generator of x and generator of y. It's pretty intriguing that you can you can sort of zip x generator with y generator and sort of pass in just declaratively same how you want to combine those together. So you pass in a function that takes two arguments, x and y. So when those generators will produce values, x and y will be, will, be, uh, will arrive here, and you just make a pair of them. And that's it. So when you uh, make point gen generate stuff, you will simply produce three, three pairs, and that's all. Note that it has no, x gen and y gen can be arbitrarily complex. Now think about how you might do this in a in an imperative or in a for loop uh, way. You, you may have a for loop. First of all, you have to ask how many times I, I should run this. Okay, you get that number. And then, okay, I have to get some x from here and then y from here, put it in a uh, pair, and that's it. And we print it or we send it somewhere or something like that. If any one of them changes, if like x changes for whatever reason, now you want maybe just prime numbers. X should be only prime. The code here does not change. How you compose x and y is immaterial of what x actually is. But in I think in your, let's say, uh, more imperative style, you will have to go open up your for loop, make some changes, and then, uh, and then you know, uh, achieve that. Over here, you just change the first line to do whatever you want to do. Maybe you want to filter some elements or, or whatever. So I think it achieves much higher modularity uh, and separation of concerns because of this. But these are all toy examples, so it may not be very apparent. But when you create more complex generators, it becomes uh, apparent in my view. So how you might implement zip? So zip has no limitations on how many arguments it takes. It could take, it could zip any number of uh, uh, generators. And uh, so it becomes very interesting how you might do that in C++14. 
So uh, the zipper, class zipper is, is the function that will, that has two, three, or four, whatever many arguments and produces some value, and a list of generators. And the dot, dot, dot is basically the, uh, the periodic templates. Uh, that's how C++ implements periodic templates. And you again call make gen from, or you remember existing generator, which is self and a list of generators. So all the generators that were passed in at compile time are pushed into or you know, are saved by value in JList. It's pretty cool how the syntax works. Very expressive syntax, I think. That you just do dot 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 over there and JList dot dot here. That's it. So all of them are here. Doesn't no matter how many. You pass the function, which is the zipper, I believe. Is this zipper? Yeah, this is the zipper function. Fun. So this takes, it must take same number of arguments as there are generators, so two, three, whatever. And then when it's time to generate a value, it's, if you recall, similar to map, but the difference is now there are multiple generators. So you call self generate, and then all the generators that were received through arguments, you call generate on that, each one of them. And the syntax for that is, yeah, in front of jlist.generate, this will be called for each generator that, that, that was passed in. And just works seamlessly. I think periodic templates uh, and functional programming are a really great match. Uh, just call the function and you turn the value. Any miscombination here in terms of use, usage, if you pass in four lambda, four generators and, uh, and the function takes three, arguments is going to spit out really horrible error messages and it's not apparent. So that's a somewhat downside of uh, this. It's expressive but then you have to sort of be correct at the first time unless uh, if not that then you will sort of uh, spend, you may spend a lot of time figuring out what's wrong here. It could be as simple as that. It's just the nature of C++. I think that's why it happens. And one more, I'm just going to drop, I'm going to just drop this again, sorry for that. It's also a monad, uh, because let's see why it's a monad. I really haven't figured a good way of, uh, you know, a more uh, easier way of you know, dropping this, but uh, why not, let's just do it. So uh, here is the output I want to produce with the generators. Pretty simple, you know, like programming 101, First assignment, right, in uh, C or Python that, that you create this. And we're back looking at a similar uh, a triangle which just produces uh, output like that. Let's see what kind of code we, we could write knowing that it's a monad and what does it really mean. So let's see if we can combine those concepts and uh, it works. So, first of all, mm. My observation is that there are how many lines here? I think nine lines. So clearly, there is a generator that produces nine things because I, I, I need a generator for nine, nine things, nine lines. And each line is sort of dependent on uh, itself in the sense the first line produces one output, the second line produces two outputs, the third line produces three outputs. So there is a clear relationship here. So I'm dealing with the fifth line, I should better produce five numbers in the range. And that observation is not to be taken lightly. This is a very simple example, but you know, this observation of, hey, this is, there's a dependency here. Maybe that means it's a monad. Uh, not every case, but it, it is in this case. So, a triangle gem will produce this. It is made of an in order generator which produces nine numbers, one to five and back to one. You could have created this by combining, you know, say two steppers, like one to five and then four to one, two steppers, but it doesn't matter. Here is an order generator, it goes from one to one, essentially. And uh, now I'm going to do a concat map. Now that is essentially the, if you have heard about this bind operation in, uh, in, in monadic lingo. So that's what it is. It says, I'm going to concat map. So there are two parts to it, of course. There is a concat part and there is a map part. Let's look at map first. 
we don't map on it, right? Uh, last time we saw, hey, it just takes one function that produces a given an int produces a string, so a to b. So it actually does that. The function here that I have passed in is actually just like that, but slightly different. It takes an int and produces a special value, which is it produces a generator itself. Hmm. So map in earlier case produced a simple string or maybe other integers or whatnot. So here it's like hmm, a one step sort of higher, I guess. It returns a stepper generator that takes i as its value as in. Remember, the first line needs to produce one and second and fifth line needs to produce five values. It will do that. Don't you think? Like make a stepper generator. If i is one, it's a stepper from one to one. When i is five, it's a step from one to five. So it is actually returning a generator that is uh, dependent on the earlier input. So let's come to the concat part. So what does concat do? Because this function itself returns a generator, it only makes sense to sort of, I guess, flatten them out. Because, you know, what else would you do with a generator? You can call generator, that's it. You know, what? there's nothing much to do, really. So this concat map function, each generator that it receives from this function, it tries to exhaust them. Saying, like, okay, I want a generator, I have nothing else to do, I just, I just keep calling generate because that's all I can do. And it will exhaust it, and that value will be returned, will be printed over here. So if you see, it starts at 1, it receives a stepper generator, which produces 1 to 1, and then it prints 1 to 1. For next time around, you get a new line. That's over here, goes back to the second line. And remember the, the input in the second time around, because it exhausted the earlier generator, it says, hey, this guy is done, so let me go back to the original, my source generator, which is the in order j. It produces two, fine. I'll pass in two here and make generator, make stepper generator to produce generator of one to two. And that's what you see over here, one to two. So, um, that's basically it, I think. So, uh, you, you have captured the dependency of uh, line, the row with the column, with the number of number of columns you have. And it is expressed here. So, this particular style of programming, um, this appears like a toy example, so like what's the point? But if you look at some other libraries um, which uh, achieve a lot of, you can capture a lot of complicated semantics with this function like map or flat map, a concat map kind of uh, function. So uh, the one particularly I uh, like is uh, reactive extensions. Uh, it is asynchronous version of all these generators. So these generators you have to ask for while to be produced. Right? You have to call this function each time. Rx generators, no, they are not generators, they are observables. You, you get values pushed at you. And guess what? The same functions were exactly the same semantics over there. And I think in that case, the power of this function become very, very apparent. Because something like this may produce value at who knows at what time, but then uh, uh, the, the flat map function will say, hey, okay, don't worry about it. Whenever it does, I will let you know what the value is with flat and I think uh, going um, from simple generators to say, hey, simple generators, knowing the concepts of uh, these uh, category three properties uh, or concepts, functors, monads, and uh, monoids, uh, helps quite a bit. Uh, so uh, here is uh, one attempt. Uh, is it uh, making sense? Uh, this is probably the, the most complicated slide, I guess. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Uh, so uh, let me know if you, uh, if you have any questions. So what is the benefit you are getting by writing such a complex code? You can write two for loops, right? It's done. That's a very good question. So the question is, why not just write two for loops? So now guess what? I mean, if you have uh, there could be cases where you might end up having three nested volumes 
or four nested for loops because things are sort of dependent on one another. There are four generators that all sort of need are dependent on one another and you have to sort of crunch something at the core of the loop. And pretty soon two loops are okay. Four is already bad and five or six if you run into that is just horrible code which is very hard to understand. But that, that nesting gets completely flattened here. Remember if you have another dependency which could be um, multiple nesting gets flattened as a, as, a, as a linear code actually. You will do another concat map which is one level of uh, peeling the onion sort of. So I think yeah, I think that that's one one benefit. It is more expressive. It it, it says what you want to achieve, not how uh, how it is done. In a sense, you don't loop necessarily. You just say, hey, I'm doing I don't know like concat map on this, and if you are if you have a, a common understanding in your team about what those functions mean, and they are comfortable using this time, uh, you can write really uh, expressive code, uh, which is uh, which is easier to test, deeper, and has uh, has uh, fewer bugs. But in terms of performance, you're not doing anything, uh, especially with the the way things are changing. Like depends. That really depends on uh, what kind of library you are working on. So I would say you you might. Uh, here it's, it doesn't matter because it is relatively a toy example, and performance for generator in testing. Maybe it's not important. It's like okay, it could take a second more. But again, I will go back to the Rx example. Uh, over here, you are processing data that is coming off of network, and over there, performance could mean a whole lot of things, right? Uh, because you might want to scale on multiple cores, and you might want to scale on multiple uh, uh, machines as well. So, if you have a programming model that does it like this. Uh, you can watch my CPPCon talk uh, once it's available. Um, I, I go into details of you know, how the same style of API design allows you to sort of partition your work across multiple data pipelines, and those data pipelines can go concurrently. You write no state whatsoever at all. Uh, and you know, it's just beautiful how code is still very stateful. You don't, like, you don't have state, obviously you don't use logs because there is nothing to guard. Everything is hidden in these in these functions, and they they are written once and for all, um, and they will do the right thing for you. So you can get performance in a way that okay, you can always rewrite this in a you know imperative style. But if you have code written in this way, you could easily scale it. You can today if you want to determine that okay, I need to run this on multiple cores, and this this has to like exhaust all sixteen cores. Because it is so nicely modularized, you can introduce concurrency very easily. Again, not in this example, the Rx example, because that library is designed for handling asynchrony and concurrency in a very uh, sophisticated way. But again, based on the same principles. So there is uh, there is time for your learning these the fundamentals and then taking those to something that really matters. So uh, if you directly jump into Rx, that can be could be overwhelming. It's like what is happening here because it's a more advanced, you know, the wiring is more intricate than just just single function. Anyway, so the, I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So are we like trying to compete with Java because in Java seven, I think they have this uh, implementation they have specified where it makes use of the cores to yeah. make things parallel. So mm -hmm. is that what we are trying to achieve? C++. You could achieve that. This is just an example of, uh, uh, this is something I found useful in my work for property-based testing. Uh, we have not used this for property testing yet. You know, we'll see that in the last few minutes of the talk, uh, how it could be done. Um, uh, Java 8, I believe, has streams. And streams are essentially, I think, generators. They are pool-based. You have to ask for the values, and you can compose operations on them uh, like this, to the same map. Contact map kind of operations. So it's a similar principle. Uh, it's exactly the same principle, in fact. Question? Can you um, explain again about the, the monad property? Yes. And what that is? The monad property. 
property. So, yeah, monad is a property, if you will, like generator is a monad, and which, in my opinion, there are very many ways to describe what a monad is, I think. Uh, I look at them as a way of uh, capturing dependencies, dependent computations. Like this computation, like generation of steps, the fifth line should produce five numbers is a dependent computation on you know on that and you can capture that. It is very abstract, so I think the best way to look at understand monads is to look at multiple examples, very different. And then you just just trust your brain that it will extract out the, the commonality in it. Because human brain is great at observing commonalities. And it just clicks like, hey, this is like map, and it's like it's the same thing. It's going on. Uh, yeah. Uh, and there are awesome explanations and talks and blog posts written online on monads. Um, you shouldn't be listening to me on monads because I, I learned this stuff relatively recently. Uh, so I may not be explaining it. I'm probably not explaining it the best possible way, simplest way. I have a question. So sure. there's no error checking in the concat map. Like assuming you're giving not integers, right? You have a cat statement that says out of range, but in your concat map, where where is the error thrown? Say you give like one comma some string, and you know that's not that's not right. Okay. But I see that you're printing the next line and then make mm -hmm. step or gen one comma. You pass, so there's no, I mean, how, how do you debug this is my question, like if you have errors, I see this is a simple example like you said, but you know, in, the, in your case of five for loops, I write multiple concat maps, multiple in order generators, how would I go about debugging something like that? Printeps, <laughs> I don't know, uh, printeps work. Um, hmm. It's. I don't have a straightforward answer for that. It can be complicated. Uh, I mean, you can always, I guess you have to sort of know what you're trying to achieve. I think breaking the statement into smaller ones or, uh, uh, you know, if you run into a situation of multiple contact maps, then the problem itself is inherently complex. So this stuff won't make your code complex unnecessarily. It is inherent complexity that will show up in your code. So uh, debugging could be a little bit complicated because uh, the, the thread of control, the, the function calls are not all your code. You jump back and forth between the library code, which is concat map, and your code, which is lambdas. So, uh, I would say it does get a little bit more complicated, but then you have to know, okay, what con concat map or those kind of functions really do, and focus on what is wrong in your functions. Perhaps there are side effects, or uh, you know, things that are uh, not expected for, for the, let's say, the monad pattern, let's say. But you, you concat map, uh, the lambda you pass to concat map has side effects. It's uh, yeah, it has, that's a good catch. That's a good string. Catch. So it's probably it would be better to remove this uh, uh, C out uh, and uh, just return this uh, stepper gen yes. and then join uh, at the end of the down the stream, join using this. Uh, into the string, and then at the end, uh, when everything is done, yeah. you just show the string. That's a good, good observation. Yeah. Just then you sure. just write a uh, unit test, and uh, you don't need to debug. You, you write unit test because it's everything, just compare, you get the result you want. Right, right. So it's a good no observation device. that there is a uh, side effect here. I mean, this is really the simplest example I could come up with that will bring something like that. Uh, if you decide to do something like this, you know, it gets complicated. I think uh, the point I want to make here about uh, the, I want to just focus on the core idea of, okay, hey, this is, if you understand this, 
try to extract out what what it's trying to do uh, in terms of model, and if you want to understand that. But yeah, uh, this is not a good idea, writing uh, a side effect over there, uh, because uh, that means, uh, you know, really the, com the what this function does really depends on how it's how it's situated around what's situated around it. You, you can unit test, basically. Cannot. Cannot. Yeah. Because uh, you how how would you capture this output? In That's right. A unit test that would verify that these numbers are produced in an order is going to be well. Let's compare this with you know they are they are laid out you know printed in a nice fashion here. So it's just one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Just count how many. Uh, maybe 24 uh, uh, objects here, uh, numbers. So uh, that's how your test is going to look like anyway. Uh, but it's, it's going to be a really boring example. Uh, but that's a good point. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, how much time do I have? Uh, OK, at least 15 minutes, maybe. So I'm going to skip the next part, which is MOLAD loss. Uh, this can get really uh, dry, I think. But uh, I have included them uh, for uh, completeness. You can go back to this slide. This will be available on slide share. To verify that uh, these laws um, must be satisfied, and they are satisfied by the generators uh, or streams, uh, if you like, uh, in, in, in Java. Uh, so here is how they could be written in C++. Code is also going to be unlevel uh, on my GitHub. So I'm going to skip this and sort of go to the more general idea behind this. Like, it's like what are we trying to achieve with this? Like, it, these words are pretty fancy and you know, almost like question like oh, why should I really worry about all these things? But it's essentially, I'm trying to hint you that the API has some API design could be mathematical. Nature. I think that's quite intriguing in my opinion. I never thought of using mathematics for API design. And generators is a very, very simple API where you can start applying any of those mathematical principles and see what comes up. And there's a general principle here, which is you create a language to solve a problem. And of course, there was no new language, it was all C++, but the API that you saw of generator is itself the language. Because as I said earlier, you, with, with those higher order functions like map, trap, and all that, you can always stay in the world of generators and, and algebraic data structure, right? And, you know, and algebra, and then uh, uh, achieve a lot of mileage through just use, reusing those functions and you know, uh, producing more generators from simpler ones. That's essentially a language, right? You produce a more complicated descriptions of programs from simpler, that's a language. That's why API is the language. And of course, you reuse all the parsing and compilation of your existing language, which is C++, which is the host language. Here, it's a language of generators. There are primitive values that are basic generators, like Boolean and know, integer. And complex values are produced by higher order functions. And the API always zipped in some generator. That's why, that's why it's a language. So here is a very general, very general principle you might want to consider in your next uh, API design uh, opportunity. What is the first class abstraction? What is that one thing that, that ticks? And then build some compositional API on top of it. I think the most interesting part, this part, compositional API is done with. Essentially it is, this becomes mechanical if you know the properties, if you understand the properties of your abstraction. I think coming up with this is the most interesting part, the first class abstraction. So those there are many examples of really popular software. Like, okay, Rx, it's observables. Streams, the stream is the, is the abstraction. Uh, Spark, if you are familiar with Spark, Apache Spark, then uh, the RDDs. Um, you know, these uh, lists in case of, let's say, pretty simple you know, SQL or databases or I enumerate you know, like C sharp. That's the first abstraction. And then, if that abstraction solves your problem, then you build compilation API by following these, these laws. If you understand the laws, have enough experience building those things, it could be very straightforward. And then now you can, your, your users are going to use this API. You can keep changing the abstraction 
to the left, to, to your, uh, uh, you know, uh, however many times you like. Because you can, the abstraction usually just, just is hidden and does not surface. What surfaces is map and, you know, functions and flat map, those kind of things. The underlying abstraction stays hidden generally because, you know, you really never saw the generator itself, I guess, uh, uh, to, to construct something useful, you just use one of, one of its functions. But how it's implemented generally does not matter. So you, you get a very strong separation of concerns with this type. And again, these concepts uh, could be very useful. Haskell tends to be very um, challenging uh, initially. And then, you know, a Scala would be a, a good start. Uh, I think they call Scala Haskellator, like an escalator to, to Haskell. I guess that's totally right. Is that? Uh, yeah, they, they call Scala the, the gateway drug to Haskell. Gateway drug to Haskell. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, I think there is there is room for uh, these concepts. For instance, in C++, um, yeah, Eric Nibler's uh, ranges work is also pretty much you know based on the similar principles. If you there is no getting around without, you may want to ignore if you want to, like these concepts, but they are in your standard library. So if you want to be a better user of those standard library features, you might as well learn these things. For instance, standard future in, uh, in C++. Then I think there is also a proposal for expected E, error, comma, T. Uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of a, an optional with, with a reason. Right? That's like, uh, another monadic structure that, that's going to be there in C++. Uh, so, uh, like it or not, they are there uh, and there is a way to understand those. Alright, so that brings me to the original motivation that was a very, very long detour uh, into, uh, you know, why US. And then coming back to the original motivation, hey, why, why are this, you know, uh, let's use it for uh, uh, input data and type generation. So you saw how how to generate data, right? Using those composer generators. I'm going to submit here that you can generate random types at compile time if you can generate random numbers at compile time. And I mean pseudo random numbers, but pretty good. Um, how many of you like seriously doubt the, the sanity of the rest of the talk? It's like random numbers at compile time. Anybody like like impossible or uh, yes, you can do that. So here is a very simple example. And let's go through this and let's see if you, if you buy, buy this. It's C program actually. Okay, no C++. So enumeration, test, foo, and random. Random is not defined. And I just print the value of enumeration. And I pass the random as a compile value constant to the to the uh, uh, the GCC or hash defined. And you, you may know that dollar random you could just write right? dollar random at say C shell or whatever, the Linux bash shell, and you just print a random number. So that's what I'm doing. In th this time it just passed in, I guess, 17695. It went there, it put the value foo to that, and that's it, just printed it out. I guess what would be a use of that? But anyway, this is one way to pass a seed, a random seed in your program at compile time. But clearly I know that you won't let me escape with just this. That's not random number generation at compile time, right? That's passing a random number. So, a slight modification. Bar does, uh, like a function, let's say, LFSR. That's the magic incantation. So foo is the same as random as before, and var is a new random number that we will generate with this magic incantation, and what is that? It's a very simple macro, actually. LFSR stands for a Linear Feedback Shift Register. It's nothing fancy. It's basically a representation of a polynomial, and those operations are uh, just bit operations on the number. And again, this is a C program, and C program, um, uh, the compiler will do all the math that it can do at compile time, and just, just do it, right? Just leave it for runtime. Also in C++, so it will be constant expectations. So. 
So here, it just calls whatever the value of foo is, and then just applies some weird pattern. There is a little bit of math behind it. I'm going to show that, uh, not in detail. So that's it. It's basically hash defined. And now, if you print the value of bar, now that really looks like some random number, starting from that, let's say. Right? So you produce a random number inside your program by cycling through this function called LFSR, linear feedback shift register. It could be constant as well. So what is LFSR? So here is a very simple example taken from uh, Wikipedia. Uh, it's a 4-bit Fibonacci LFSR. You can imagine a circuit like this, that circuit is all I believe. So uh, it basically cycles, it's actually animated GI, it's maybe a little hard to see. It, uh, with four bits, you get 16 possibilities, and it just cycles through them one by one. Except when it is all zeros. When it's all zeros, it's stuck. It, it cannot produce any new values. But when there is at least one one, you can hope to complete the cycle. And by, by my point, it's just guaranteed to produce all the numbers, except all zeros. So that's the uh, feedback polynomial in this case, which is x raised to 4 plus x raised to 3 plus 1. And these are the taps, sort of. This is the, the taps where the, the input is received for all the new numbers. So these are 4 and 3 are the taps. So numbers go from the reader body. So here is the LFSR that uh, you saw in the code. Much longer, 16 bit LFSR, and it produces. 16-bit numbers that are that look very random, but they are very predictable, uh, very easy to compute, uh, certainly at compiling. And the taps in this case are, are those. You could have 52-bit LFSR, and it is, uh, you have ample uh, random numbers at compiling. And how you might use it? You know, we want to create random types actually, because the the property test that I started with. Did not know its type, so I'm just going to make one up, literally. Like because serialization should work for any type, I'm just going to create any type. Let's see what compiler produces for me. So here's how you might create uh, the, the first part of it. Uh, how you, you might create sort of you have to map those random numbers that we saw at compile line to a random type. So here's a type map, a dentist specialization. Uh, only three cases, I guess, or four cases here. Mm, so zero means int, one means scar. 2 means float and 3 means double. That's my map. Uh, you know, if I select one of these numbers randomly, maybe I will get random types out because it's a map from an integer to a type. So this is very basic, actually, uh, you know, um, meta programming that going from an integer to a type. That's exactly what we will do. So here it's random term. How you might create a random term? You pass in a C. So remember that you know, C++ templates allow you to pass integral values to the tuple, uh, to, to any template. And you do an LFSR on the C, mod 4, 0 to 3. And who knows, what, depending upon the C, it just produces some number, some number and uh, some type. Maybe it's one of those four, of course. For a larger map, you can imagine it can produce other other types as well, or even even other tuples. If you like. So the second one, this is deliberately more verbose. Uh, this you probably won't write this because you want to create random. This particular one produces only three elements in the tuple. But the trick is, each time you produce a number LFSR C, you have to pass that number back into the LFSR. So that's how the, the, the feedback polynomial works. And as long as you are able to achieve this recursively at compile time, it's some meta programming code. I'm not going to show that here. It gets a little more a little dry, you know, harder to do sort of uh, to get the point out. I think this is much straightforward. So again, you have to mod uh, by four on that number, and whatever that type is, is going to be my first, second, and third type in this case. I just put them together, that's my random term. Uh, does it make sense so far? All right, and this is how you use it. Main, a random tuple. The random number is again, the original random seed is passed in. 
So it is predictable. You can just pass in the same random number over and over, and it will try to generate the same um, same type as long as you don't make changes here. So you can also debug if something breaks. And I'm using Goose Debugger in this case. It just prints the type that it produced randomly. For these numbers, that's the one. So if you make changes, if you pass in a different random number, chances are it will produce a different uh, tuple. Because, uh, you could have tuples of tuples if you like. So that, that's a random type. And remember, now, now what do we have here? We have a way to generate random types. And given a type, we have a way to generate random values for it. Because all those zipping generators, for tuples, you will use zip. Uh, you will use a generator for float, and double, and character, and zip them up to produce a tuple. So what are we going to do? Actually, we don't have to do anything at this point, uh, up to this point, to kind of test your code. Um, oh, I guess I have some slide on uh, zip. It's similar to the earlier one. So uh, again, uh, make triple, uh, call make triple on each value that is produced uh, by the individual generator. So uh, this is a, so uh, the args goes. This is a gen factory. So you need a factory for each type, each basic type, uh, float character double, and then you just make up a double and uh, uh, pass to zip. That's how it produces the value. Remember that you can pass in your own generators. It is no longer limited. This is this looks like a default generator, but you can always pass in your own float generator, which will let's say I'm always in the range of 100 to 200. That's the only piece that will change, uh, nothing else. And that's it. So you can generate types by passing a random seed as hash defined, a compiled a random number using LFS, you produce successively. Some temporary meta programming for synthesis, type synthesis. The types, although also have members, member names. Mm. I use a string generator for member names, so I can create types uh, on the fly uh, and, and its members as well. And then reflex to map those types to the type query that I did. Remember, the original motivation for this was uh, reflex uses uh, any type. To, uh, you can send that type over network because it serializes it and, and, and data. So uh, that's what this is what goes over network. So here are some numbers. I mean, these don't mean really uh, anything to you, I know. Uh, so for these numbers, I realize hey, it's like produces three nested structures, and maybe that number, which is slightly different, three to thousand, it produced fifty-one nested structs. It's like a monster of a type, and I want to make sure that hey, is my property holding up? My serialization and deserialization should work on a on a beast type like that. Forty one messages of those kind of things. There are some cases very innocent looking numbers two one five two. It crashed the compiler itself because mm, it just went into like I don't know like seven hundred nested uh, structs. It just did not pretty much like had no way to end the recursion of generating types. Uh, and the size of the tuple itself, like static size, was about two megabytes, like three megabytes. Those are the cases that you have to sort of uh, shield the generator from, uh, because you know, right now what you saw is a pretty, pretty wild sort of uh, generator. It just keeps keeps on going. You may have to like, cap how many, how many nested labels it goes and those kind of things. So a little more Meta program. But for my purpose, I just stay away from these functions, these uh, numbers. If they come up, I don't, I don't pay attention. I just produce a new number and just test the, test the, uh, the other one. So you can, you know, for each build, essentially you are testing uh, with a, with some random type and data. That's that. That's all I have uh, for you today. Any, any questions? Can I answer any? I have a general question, which is you're talking about the application of the math and category theory to uh, 
generators for testing. So I know that another math term, namely calculus, calculus has been applied to lambda. But that's different. Are you referring to lambda calculus? Then? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm not the best person to uh, answer this question. Uh -huh. uh, lambda calculus is a very theoretical language. It's a, it's a language that decides what's computable, what's not. Ah, right? okay. It's, okay. it's equivalent okay. to say Turing machine. Ah, okay. If you can capture Whether something, it's Turing complete, then it, you, you or have anything. Turing complete. Turing. Yeah. Okay. Then you have a way to express that in lambda calculus. It is, what I have read about that is very interesting because it uses very few concepts of a function, an application of a function, and one, one more thing. And it's amazing how you can build arbitrarily anything with that, which is computable. Uh, it's a basis of um, a lot of things, I guess, a lot of... Uh, I heard things like, you know, curry Howard isomorphism, and then, you know, those kind of things are really like, when you're writing programs, you're writing proofs, and those kind of things. That, that theoretical underpinning mm -hmm. can be understood by understanding lambda calculus. Isomorphism. That particular one. Yeah. Yeah, which is, um, I don't know the, what's the practical applicability in like your day-to-day -day coding would be. Right. But if you run against like creating a new language, you might want to consider like, can I borrow some concepts from this and maybe, uh, that, that, so I something like that is happens to be my like 10 year goal maybe. Ah. It's not easy stuff, I, at least that I, I found that. It's not, it takes a while to okay. absorb it. So it's been done, I don't know, like 1927, I think that's when. So what area here. of math is that? I just, you don't see it anymore. I don't know what branch that really is. I don't know. I don't think it's denotation semantics maybe. I don't know. That's a really large branch of work. What, what does it mean? What, what do the programs need? That's, okay. that's what's related. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I guess your comment is about whether generators, how do generators in other languages compare with this? So, is that right? Yeah, like, yeah, like Python has generator implementation. Mm, Haskell doesn't call it generators because the list itself is lazy. So it's sufficient. Uh, it is like generator, but it's lazy anyways. So, uh, Java 8 streams are could pass as generators, I guess. So I mean, there are, sim they, they are, I think, based on the same principles. The, the look and feel might be different because the language might have some capabilities that you don't get in C++. Very simple syntax, or like do notation in Haskell, and maybe list comprehension in Python. All those things can be built on top of this. Yeah, so that that's my, Alright, thank you very much. Thank you.